And uh, I was fully aware of last week's problem, so I decided to take matters into my own hands. In case the lights do go out, I came prepared. <laughs> Let's put this on and let me see, where do I turn it on here? There we go. So, I'll be able to at least read my notes and we'll be just fine. So if the lights go out, we'll keep going. All right. All right. <laughs> Let me tell you a little bit about my background. Some of you know me, some of you don't. I really committed my heart to Christ in 1996, and I was living in Germany at the time. Uh, God was, had to take me all the way to Germany to get me to a place where I said, okay, God, I surrender truly to you, and not taking on my father's idea of faith, but what God had done in me. I came back in late 1998 and then found Lake City Church in 99. This was during the era that Tom Alexander, who is down at Two Rivers Church, has planted that. Tom was here and building a college and career group. And it was kind of fun to see Nate leading worship today because I remember when Nate first led worship uh, in the college and career group and, and we were working together as a team and uh, it was not quite, Nate, I apologize, I don't mean to embarrass you, but it wasn't quite the same as it is today. It was, uh, we did the best we could with what we had. But Nate went on to help plant Two Rivers Church and was the worship leader there and has come back and is just a tremendous friend of mine. So Nate, wherever you are, shout out to you. Uh, during the college and career days though, Tom Alexander really built a lot into us as young men and women. And we were young men and women in our 20s and 30s and God was focusing through him on some of the things that we would then carry forward in Christ. Um, people like Tom Alexander, Brian White, Tom Flaherty, uh, Milton Pope. These are people who had an impact on my life from this church. And I've also found many of you that have spoken into my life or have greeted me or have done things that really were meaningful to me. So I want to say thank you. It's a real joy to be here. And as I look out, I can see many people who have touched my life. And I'm deeply grateful. It's really a privilege to be here today to preach. My sermon title is From Wounds to Scars. And let me start out by a couple definitions here. Wounds come from lies <clears throat> left behind from our life experience and sin. Scars are where we have embraced God's truth and let God heal the wound. Okay, that's kind of the overview. Let's read the scripture. The key scripture here is from John 8. Verses 31, 36 through 36. I'm using the New American Standard Version. So Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed in him, if you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. They answered him, we are Abraham's descendants as have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it you say you will become free? Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son does remain forever. So if the son makes you free, you are free indeed. Let's pray. Father, I ask that as we talk about wounds and scars, Lord, that you would plow through our defenses. God, that you would open our hearts to the things that your spirit wants to say and you'd work in our hearts and in our lives to bring us greater freedom through the truth of who you are. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. When I was in college and career and in grad school, this was the year 2003, I was meeting with a new couple, Amy and Silas Gimare, and I got to play a part in Silas coming to Christ, and it was so fun. He was a grad school peer of mine who had come from uh, Nepal, and didn't know what he believed about God and was wrestling with that. But God worked powerfully in his life. He ended up marrying a missionary child named Amy Gimere. Some of you may know her, Amy Elliott formerly. And I'm sitting in the living room of Silas and Amy and we'd hang out and Amy had said, she had started doing this thing called theophostic, which I didn't know what that was at the time, but it's basically healing prayer. And she had begun just praying for me in her own quiet time and wrestling and contending for me and by the way, if you've ever had someone contend for you, it is incredible. It is incredible. And so she said to me, she said, Chris, I am praying for you. You have so many wounds in your life. And you have so many places you've been hurt. And I'm just praying that God would free you and heal you from these things. And as she's saying this, in my head, I'm going, 
What are you talking about? I don't have a lot of wounds in my life. Uh, yeah, okay, I had a little bit of a goofy childhood and some things that were painful, but you know that, hey, you know, you just ignore that. that. You bounce back from that. That's what I was always told. You know, you bounce back. Little did I know that that was going to be the seed that began this adventure, <laughs> tough adventure in my life of finding freedom from some wounds. Today, I want to take you on a little bit of my journey. And let me tell you, it was God through a non-linear, God-crafted process that God brought me to places to expose the lies in my heart. God's word before would be rejected in my head because the wounds in my heart in anger would say, that's not true, God. That's not true. God gently helped me to embrace his truth to dispel lies that were left behind, which I believed about myself, about others, and about him. I'm gonna be sharing some of my story of how God exposed wounds in my life, offered healing, and ultimately created a scar. This is gonna be heavy for a little bit. I just wanna tell you that. Uh, you might not be able to relate directly to every experience I had. Everyone has their own story. But by sharing some of these principles, which God has used to free me, I hope that there are things that help you to be free. So let me start out with the wounds we carry. Now let me give a disclaimer about my growing up. First, I've asked my mother and father and one of my brothers permission to share these stories, and they have given it to me and encouraged me with the freedom to share, and I'm grateful for that. So there's no way that I'm trying to slam my parents in this. And also, I don't intend to dishonor them in any way. My parents are awesome people, and you will hopefully see also the love that they have for me in this as I go. But like me, my parents had their own wounds. And as I'll say later, hurt people, hurt people. And so from that context, let me begin with my story. I was born in Beaverdam, Wisconsin, about 40 miles up the road, to two wonderful parents and to two older brothers. My mother decided to go back to graduate school, and she was taking classes in comparative literature and women's studies, and eventually went on to get her PhD. When I was three, my mother left my father for another woman. My parents formally divorced when I was four. This triggered my dad to search and say, what's the real meaning in life? He didn't feel like he could compete with a woman, and so he began to say, what's real, what's true? And during this time is when he found Christ in his own life at a charismatic prayer meeting. My dad began to pour into us, and I remember when I was five years old, the first time a prayer was answered in my life that I was aware of. And it was my brothers and I were at my dad's. And my brother Steve, his friend Liga, came up to Beaver Dam where we lived. And they had a portable TV. Okay, this was 1975, to date myself. A portable TV wasn't so common, and this was really cool. And we didn't have a TV. So we wanted to watch cartoons. So I watched my brother, and you know, I was only five. I watched my brother and my dad and Liga. They were making these things they called antennas, and they got out coat hangers and had them stretched all over the living room and, and uh, tin foil, and I think we went through maybe a whole roll of tin foil, I don't know, <laughs> trying to catch some stations, and we couldn't get anything. And we were disappointed as kids, you know, this is cartoons. So my brother Steve, my oldest brother, said, hey, let's go pray about this. So it was me and Liga and Tom and Steve, and we went into a room, and Steve said, well, God... You say, if we agree upon anything on earth, you're going to do it. So, God, we want cartoons in the morning. Amen. <laughs> well, lo and behold, you know how God works with children, right? It's awesome. Lo and behold, the next morning, although it was snowy, we had cartoons. And I remember going, wow, God can really do big things. This God is big. It was my first prayer answered. So my brothers and I lived with my mom until I was five. It was Christmas that year that they decided they wanted to live with my dad. And I wanted to live with my mom still. So my brothers moved with my dad, moved up with my dad in Beaver Dam, and I stayed with my mom in Madison here. She was working on her PhD at that point. And at age six, the apartment we lived in burned down. It was actually April 1st, 1977. And I was up with my dad that weekend, and when my mom called up, Hey, the apartment's burned down. We said, hi, April Fools. Good one, Mom. That's funny. 
She said, no, the apartment burned down. And so we went to try to gather what we could, and the only thing that I had was a teddy bear that I was able to take. So it was kind of starting over in life in that way, at least with my mom. We moved in with my mother's partner at that point. And we lived with her partner and her, I lived with her partner and her for several years. I'd spend the weekends with my brother. Every weekend is what my parents had arranged. So we would be together as brothers, which was great. So we'd go to my dad's one weekend, or we'd come to my mom's one weekend. So either I was hosting or I was at my dad's. My father in his own hurt would say negative things about my mother and send messages through, for some reason I got to be the bearer, maybe because I lived with her, of these messages. And it was things about what she was doing and how wrong it was. And this was one of the first lies that I was aware. The lie left behind was that I had to carry these messages and craft them so I could keep peace in the family. I was responsible to bring my parents back together. And that was a wound from that lie left behind. During the time of living with my mom, I didn't know how to present or talk about my mom's partner. I felt like no matter what I said, I was either being deceptive to people or it was just horribly painful. I didn't know how to introduce her. So I began to say, this is a friend of the family or a close friend of the family. And although it was awkward, it was safe. At age seven, my mom's partner and I got in a physical fight. We were having a T-bone steak dinner and we both wanted to gnaw on the bone. When it got physical, I looked to my mom and for a split second, she didn't know where her loyalties were. And that created a deep wound that I would later find. And the lie that was left behind is, I'm alone and I have to protect myself. So from that, I began acting out. I began misbehaving a lot. My mom took me to a counselor and then we started going as a whole family. My dad would come down from Beaver Dam and try to deal with us through counseling and it wasn't very effective. I wanted to live with my dad, I had decided, and a custody battle ensued. One morning during this, my mom was packing school lunch for me and she asked me which of my two favorite yogurts I wanted. There was the cherry yogurt or the blueberry yogurt. And I couldn't decide. And she said, Chris, why? What's so hard here? Just pick one. And I said, I can't. She said, why? I said, because I don't want to hurt one of the yogurt's feelings. (laughs) And then she explained to me what it meant to be projecting something on an object rather than on people and that the yogurts didn't have feelings. But the lie that that left behind was that choosing Choice meant choosing which parent I loved less. And that was a tough one. In the end, my father won the custody battle and I moved up with him. And through some painful times, my father broke me of the independence that I had developed to protect myself. But in that process, he didn't rebuild me. And being the new kid, I was teased a lot and I've always been a sensitive person. So unfortunately, that hit a little bit closer to home than for others. I began not to like myself, and I would cringe at hearing the name Chris Lancer when I would stand in the lunch line, or when it was roll call at school. It wasn't until 11th grade when there was this girl who who liked me, and, and I thought she was pretty, and I thought, wow, maybe I'm okay. Maybe I'm not so bad. I always wanted to please my dad when I was living with him, but my dad had particularly high standards. I felt that if I, to please my dad, I had to do something perfect. Or when I found a better way to do something or a better system, he always lit up and you'd see the joy and I thought, that's love, that's what I'm after. So when I was 15, I cleaned the entire garage unsolicited, two and a half hours I spent. And when he came home from work, he was delighted. And as he was going in, he looked at the door and said, oh, you missed a spot. And suddenly the disappointment hit me. And I thought, what did I do this all for? I was so discouraged and devastated. And the lie that was left behind was that I'm not loved unless I'm perfect. I continued to try to do things of what I believed my father would love. It was many years later that I learned that it was his perfectionism that was the issue and it wasn't as much about me as it was about him. 
growing up, my father would make statements about how he was God's representative to me and how what he said was equivalent to what God said. And while he was only half serious, I took the serious side of that. And it was extremely impactful. What it meant is my dad's idiosyncrasies were really the same as God's. I found this impact most during my freshman year in college. My dad had a way of folding clothes when I was growing up. He would fold the shirts. He'd spend sometimes hours doing laundry, but he'd fold them. They, they looked like they just came out of the package. And that was the right way to fold clothes. There was always the right way or the best way. Everything else was lesser. And so I'm in college, and of course, I'm folding my clothes meticulously, and laundry took a long time, probably why I hate laundry to this day. <laughs> and one of my roommates, or a roommate that I had, I watch him, he's doing his laundry, he put the, put the sleeves together, fold them, and he was done with folding. I'm like, oh, you can fold clothes like that? And I'm thinking, that's not the right way, though. <laughs> but I decided it was a worthwhile exchange. Five minutes to 45 minutes comparison. I'm in college, I'd rather have fun or... If I had to study, study. And so I tried folding my laundry the way my roommate did. And by the second time I had done that, I felt so guilty. I felt like I had sinned. My conscience was, was coming at me and I felt so condemned. And so I called my dad and said, Dad, Dad, I'm really worried. I, I tried folding my laundry differently and I don't know what that means and I feel like, I'm, like this is wrong and I'm doing something against you. And it was at that point he realized his own failure. And he was apologetic and sorry for what he had done. He said, no, he said, Chris, I do it that way because it fits in my drawer well and because I like the way it looks. Fold your laundry any way you want. And that was a place that was the beginning of freedom, but the wound was far deeper than that, unfortunately. The lie left behind was if I don't become my dad or like my dad, I am rejected by God. And that was a tough one. Now let me take an aside here to talk briefly about homosexuality before I move forward. What I believe is sexual sin is anything outside of the context of marriage of a male and a female. That means if you're dating and you're sexually intimate, that means if you choose sexual intimacy in any context outside of marriage. And while different, scar, different sins create different wounds, sin is sin. There's no better or worse sin, folks. It's simply taking a relationship into a context that God didn't intend it to be. Sometimes in the church we seem to focus on it and some even believe it's like the unpardonable sin. It's not true. What about the sins that we entertain as okay? What about lies? Little lies. Oh, we're trying to protect someone with our lies. Really? What about gossip? Or what about calling someone saying, you know, I just saw so-and-so doing this. We need to pray for them. We need to be in prayer. Is that not gossip? Check your heart. And it's the heart's intent which will tell the truth. Sin is sin. And God tells us to love one another. And I encourage you to stop singling out certain sins and looking at the other person. Instead, look in the mirror at your own heart and say, God, where have I offended you? And where possibly, but there, but by the grace of God, go I, because I would act that out. It's in my heart, but I'm just not living it out. And Jesus said, what you've done in your heart, you've done. The best example in my life of unconditional love was not from someone in the church. It was my mother. She is Jewish and doesn't believe in Christ, but she supports me, encourages me. And that Dominican Republic trip that Greg was talking about, she actually gave and donated toward it because she thought it was important because I thought it was important. What a mom I have. She's awesome. So with these wounds, let me ask the question, why be free? So what? So maybe you've identified through my story that you carry some wounds or you can make some parallels in your own life. Why do you care to be free? Well, let me give you a couple reasons. First, emotional wounds are painful. I don't know about you, but they've been very painful in my life, as you may have heard with my story. And the enemy uses those as hooks to pull you in and to speak lies over and over and over and over to you. You probably have that cassette deck. Well, let me move to, you probably have that MP3 player iPod in your own head. 
that is playing the same lies over and over and over to you. And those are the things that usually touch on these places of lies and wounds in our life. Secondly, I learned this at a promise keepers, promise, promise keepers, promise keepers, I like that better. A promise, a prom, no, I can't say it. All right. I was at a conference in 2006 <laughs> for men, and a gentleman spoke, Bishop Joseph Garlington out of Pennsylvania. And he was talking about wounds from childhood, and he made a statement which really stuck with me, which is that wounds buried alive stay alive. And if you think about a cut that you get, or a wound, and if you don't clean it out, but you just put a Band-Aid over it, it's that idea. That wound will fester, that wound will get paused. It's, it's horrible. And we do that in our own lives when we're hurt. And sometimes those are coping mechanisms, and that needs to happen for a time just to survive. I get that. But those wounds that are buried alive are not dead. They're still alive. Thirdly, wounds cripple us from being fully who we are. Wounds bring doubt, discouragement, and also keep us from trusting God. In 2008, I was in a Bible school with Youth with a Mission, and it was called Bible School for the Nations. And this is a, a course where we study chronologically through the Bible in 17 weeks, and then we do an outreach, a missions trip. And during, it's a full-time live-in program, so it's really intense. Four or five hours a day, we are studying the Word of God, and then we are doing homework four or five hours a night and a whole variety of other things. And tremendous time. And during the beginning of this, before we even got into the Bible, the leader said, now there are presuppositions we all come to the Bible with. And the best way they describe presupposition, it's like the colored lenses that you look at the Bible through based on your past and your experience. And I said, okay, great. Well, as we began with Genesis, I also began to realize that there are many places in my life that I didn't truly trust God. And where I knew the truth in my head, but my heart somehow said that's not true. That's not true. And it began to get exposed more and more in my own heart, and I came to this realization. I said, I don't trust God in a lot of places. But I had also come to the end of myself in trying to make it happen, which meant that I didn't trust God, but I needed God to help me to trust him, but I didn't trust God enough to trust him to help me to trust him. Does that make sense? <laughs> it felt that crazy in my head. It really did. And so, I, what do I do? I just began crying out to God and saying, God, I don't know how to trust you. And I don't even trust you to know how to trust you. Would you work in my heart? Would you free me? And it was like there was this rug underneath me. And this wasn't the first time in my life I'd felt this. Like this rug underneath it was gonna get ripped out and I was gonna go tumbling into something, the unknown, and it scared me. And about a week after, I began praying. We're in our class, and we had been talking about Genesis, and one of the teachers had, who had a nine-month-old daughter, it was really cute, she's running around the, the school, and he was talking about how God creates and how God loves us. And he had talked about how he and his wife had dreamed about what his child would become before she was born. And later that afternoon, there was a worship time, and God took me into this place. And I don't know if this took a split second or a minute or what, but I began to see God unfolded all of creation before me from before there was a world and before time up until now. And as God did, he showed me that early on, before the creation of all things, that he desired me, that he had dreamed of me, that it was his desire that I be here. And not only did he love me, but he liked me. He liked who I was. Now you may say, what does that have to do with trust? For me, it had everything to do with trust because my real issue wasn't about trust. My real issue was about not being loved and this idea of perfection to be loved. And in one instant, God blew that away like that. It's a tremendous place of healing. Next, when we walk out of our wounds, which are lies, we wound others. In other words, we live from our woundedness. And as we live from our woundedness, which is based on lies, we live on lies and we hurt others. Hurt people, hurt people. As I was wrestling through some of the toughest times, there was a song that, that I would listen to on the radio. And it was by Sarah Groves. And it really impacted me to think about not just getting free for me, but for the future. And the chorus of the song goes like this. 
Remind me of this with every decision. Generations will reap what I sow. I can pass on a curse or a blessing to those I will never know. And that's so true. Why work on our wounds? Because we are passing either on wounds or blessing. I encourage you, pass on blessing. Work on your wounds. Lastly, why be free? Because if not, we run to things to numb the pain. Even though they're often empty, some of them are sin, some of them we don't call sin straight up. <clears throat> some of the commonly thought ones are alcohol and drugs and, and sex. <clears throat> but as Christians, we can run to things that are more socially acceptable or Christian world acceptable. How about food? I know that when I'm stressed out or when I'm wrestling with something, I can run to food. And I have something to prove it here. <laughs> we can also run to media. TV, movies. How about the news? How about internet? Video games? All right, I'm going to step on a couple toes here. How about religion? How about if I just read my chapter a day, I can ignore all these other things because God loves me. As long as I perform for God, I'm okay. That was a lie I ate. Don't eat it. <laughs> Please. It's really about the heart behind it and asking, your, asking the question of yourself, am I running from something? Am I running? And try not to face something that I need to face. Let me talk briefly about some of the lies which were left behind from childhood wounds that I didn't talk about. Lie. God is close to me when he uses me and speaks to me, but he doesn't care about me when he's silent or not using me. Early on, when I lived in Germany, we had this youth group that was going through revival, and it was so awesome. And then I come back to the States, and I felt dead because God wasn't using me or speaking to me in the way he was there. The exposure of this lie was times of God being silent and having to wrestle with the idea of whether he is with me. See, the silence wasn't a bad thing. It was a maturing thing, and it was healthy. And the scar that I have now is seeing God's faithfulness and follow through. Even when I don't hear him, I'm not used by him from my perspective. It's always interesting in those times that you feel like God isn't doing anything and a year later or six months later you look back and you see what God was really doing and it was powerful. Sometimes more powerful than the times when you think, God's using me. Yeah. True, huh? Another lie. If I sinned and beat myself up until it was so painful for me, I wouldn't do it again. The exposure was that I was always guilty and I found that if I did something wrong and beat myself up, instead of running away from sin, I ran back toward it. The solution to this was very interesting because it coupled with another lie that said I can't be loved unless I'm sinless. And I began to wrestle with this, especially habitual sin. I'm sick of God. I kept saying, God, I'm sick of me. I'm sick of me. I'm in grad school. And I, I remember one day I locked myself in a room and I was going to pray for freedom. And I said, I'm not leaving God until I get freedom from this habitual sin in my life. I'm just locking myself and I prayed for hours. And after three hours, God said, I hear you, but it's not going to go the way you think. Well, what does that mean? Great. All right, God. The way that God began to deal with this was very different than I thought, similar to the trust thing. I went to a retreat in college and career and I had this issue of habitual sin and Brian White, some of you know him, Brian White was speaking and he came up and I came up to him and whispered in his ear, this is what I'm struggling with, this habitual sin. And he begins to pray for me. He doesn't even address the sin. He doesn't say anything about it. He said, Chris, God loves you. God loves you so much. You don't even understand how much God loves you and God is for you. God loves you. And he kept saying this over and over and I began to weep, but I didn't know what this was. So what? Because I thought that I had to work my way out of sin rather than being loved out of sin. It's a whole different perspective. Yes, it's healthy to put boundaries in. Yes, there are a lot of things like that that are good practices. 
but it's being loved by the Father away from the things that bring devastation to my life. And that was another truth that God exposed and brought a scar to. Another one was if I was better or smarter or more able than those around me, I could feel good about myself. (laughs) God's solution was surrounding me with people that were very, very talented. And I was no longer this person who could just figure it all out and could stay a step ahead of the game. And I worked at a company called Direct Supply, which were very tough years because God was exposing and dealing with this. He put me in with a creme de la creme crowd where I was just average. And that was different. But God had me wrestle with these things. Anyway, I could go on and on about some of these lies and the freedom that God brought. But let's talk about some of the ways in which we can become free. I'm going to share with you some of the principles that God has shown me in the last decade of walking out, becoming free. And I will tell you that I am not completely free in every area. I still have wounds, but God is healing those. And other places I have scars. When I was preparing for this message, it was about a week and a half ago, I'm <clears throat> I began to see some other wounds in my life. And by that Saturday, which I'd set aside to kind of tweak this and fine tune it, I was defeated. I said, God, I have wounds. How can I talk about this when I have wounds in my life? (laughs) Who am I? And a friend in Las Vegas, these are some people, Bill and Roseanne Sesta, who I love. I met them nine years ago. I've seen them three or four times physically in my life, and they pray for me every day. Just to tell you how committed they are, Bill fasted and prayed for five days for this church service that God would move in my heart and in your hearts. And I was talking to Bill and Roseanne. Roseanne said, Chris, what are you, aren't you preaching in a week? I said, yeah. He goes, what do you expect? Do you expect this to be a walk through the park? She said, if you really want to make it easy, just download some sermon that doesn't matter and isn't going to do anything for people. And, and the enemy, I guarantee you, will let go. But the truth will set people free. And I went, you know, God, I may have wounds, but I have scars. And there's a voice behind those scars that people need to know and need to hear. So by the grace of God, I'm going to share with you some of these things. So, first of all, to become free of the wounds that we carry, the two key elements are truth and forgiveness. The key verse said, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And in these places of lies, we need to be forgiven or to ask forgiveness. But to start, we need to know God values you. I found this so critical. Look, he made you in his own image and likeness. And God says you have value in Genesis 3. And it's from that value as being in the image and likeness of God that we stand and we say, God cares about me and I matter. Secondly, know that God is for you. Let me start with Psalm 139. 1 through 4. I don't, I don't think I had it put on the screen. Sorry about that. But in Psalm 139, God talks about, or David talks about, where can I run from your love? If I climb to the heavens, you're there. If I run to the sunrise, you're there. Your thoughts about me. You know when I get up. You know before I sit down, God. You are keenfully aware of all my ways. And David said, this is too much for me. It's too amazing for me. And then later he says, you knit me together in my mother's womb. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And that's true about all of us. God is for us. Romans 8, 31, 32 says, if God is for us, who can be against us? He did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not together with him give us all things? God values you and is for you. And clearly he is for your freedom. The next thing I learned is you need to call sin, sin. Pastor Tom actually helped me to see this. I didn't get this before. And this was fairly recently. I was protecting my parents in my own heart because I was still trying to keep the family together or bring peace. And I wasn't able to say that I had been sinned against. And the problem with that, and I thought that was a good thing. Hey, I protect them. This is my family. The problem with that is if you don't acknowledge sin that's against you or sin you've done, there's no place to confess, is there? There's no place to forgive And so the wound remains. And so, admit and take ownership for your own sin. Or even the portion of the sin which you played into. 
There were things that happened in my childhood that happened because of the circumstances, but I also chose a response, and I have to confess that before God and others. Also recognize where you were sinned against, and forgive the other person or yourself as Christ forgave you. The Bible has several things about forgiveness, and God even at one point compares forgiveness that we've been forgiven much, and that he's asking us only to forgive a little and to not forget that and to make sure that you recognize how much you've been forgiven so that you may also forgive. The third thing about becoming free is to expose the wound. Now this takes courage, I will tell you. First, exposing the wound to God to really get real with God. Psalm 109, 21 and 22 says, but you, O God, the Lord, deal kindly with me for your namesake. Because your loving kindness is good, deliver me, for I am afflicted and needy, and my heart is wounded within me. God understands you're wounded. God understands all the things that have happened. You're not hiding it from him. As a matter of fact, of all people who know, he knows. But because the Holy Spirit is a gentleman, He will not force himself on you. He will wait for you to acknowledge and open up and say, yes, God, I see this. I don't even understand it, but would you heal me? Would you bring truth into this place? So what I began to do was tell him exactly the truth, that I was hurt, that I was angry, that I was upset. Sometimes I knew, God, this isn't you. It's not your fault, but I have no one else to blame but you. So for the moment, you're going to be my punching bag. And he seemed okay with that. Expressing to God the injustice that you believe was caused to you or that you caused. And let God speak truth to you in that situation. I will tell you about truth. Sometimes God was wisely silent with me and only in hindsight can I understand the wisdom of his silence, which is that there were things I wasn't really ready to hear. And if he would have spoke to me about it, I would have said, no! (laughs) You're full of it. I don't believe that. I can't hear that. And God understands what you can hear and he will peel it back gently layer by layer to really get at the root to set you free. And then there's a place that I found which is very important is about renouncing vows that are made in anger or frustration, especially against God or against others. And let me explain to you what that is. A vow is a commitment or a statement made like I will never trust anyone again. I will never date again or be, I will never trust women. I will never, pick your thing. I'll never listen to my mom again. Those things create in the spiritual realm contracts which keep us bound. And the enemy really has a place with that. And it's as simple as undoing the contract. It's a verbal statement. And it's as simple as saying, God, I renounce, I break that contract that I made in my heart, and God will expose this stuff. It's not like you have to wrestle through it. God will expose it. But it's this place saying, God, I renounce that. Forgive me for making these statements that have held me bound and have helped me to stay bound. And God, I ask for your freedom. And it takes away that hook the enemy has in your life and allows you to come to a place of freedom. So renounce it. The problem with these lies and with this iPod going on in your head His faith comes by hearing, as we know. You know, the scripture, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The problem is faith comes by hearing, period. If you hear the word of God, faith will come, the right faith will come. But if you're hearing lies over and over, we believe those. It's why propaganda works. It's why governments throughout history have told certain things to their citizen because they they believe it, they hear it, and they live by it as if it's true. So faith does come by hearing. After you've broken the vows, accept God's forgiveness. Paul says to take every thought captive. You know that the thoughts that come into your head are not necessarily from God. There are three other voices I want to expose other than the voice of God. One is your own voice. One is the voice of others, especially from childhood and the lies that someone has spoken over you. And then there's the voice of the enemy. And so Paul says take these thoughts as they come in captive. Don't just eat them. Don't just digest them as if they're truth. Take the thought captive 
and cast down imaginations which exalt themselves against God and what he says. If God says he's for you and the thoughts are saying God hates you, you can know that's not from God. And you fight it with the word of God. No. God is for me. Who can be against me? He does not spare his own son but gave him up for us all. How will he not together with him give us all things? It's these places. Now I'm also gonna say, let me move on as far as exposing. There's another place to expose. It's to a trusted friend, counselor, or a small group. James 5, 16 says, Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. The key here is that someone can pray for you. You're doing two things. You're exposing it so the enemy can't put you isolated and get you isolated in attack. And you're also in a place for prayer. You know, gazelles, like I've heard this, gazelles, when they're in a pack, lions got nothing on them. But if the lions can get one gazelle on the side, that gazelle is toast and the lions devour them. And it's just like that with the enemy. It says he prowls around like a lion, waiting to devour who he may. Keeping these things inside can be just that. And the truth is 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says this. I'm gonna focus on the first part. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to man. You think your sin's unique? Guess again. It's not. It's common to man. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted but beyond what you can bear. And the rest talks about getting freedom. When you're tempted, you can actually find a way out. But know that your temptation, your failure is not unique. I don't think you're going to shock everybody. I really don't. Another person can also help you to see something that you cannot see. See, when I was in the middle of this stuff, I couldn't see clearly. You can't see the forest through the trees. You can only see the two trees that are right in front of your face. And someone else who's outside the situation, whether a small group, a trusted counselor, a friend, can see these things in your life and can also offer places of healing and help you with that. I've had many people along this journey that I'm grateful for. I have two great roommates, Curtis and Brad, who are fantastic guys and who have made our apartment a safe place to talk and deal with our wounds and our issues. I have people like Wendy who have stuck with me through tough times in my life. There are pastors here on staff that have poured into my life. There are people throughout my past that have helped me to be free. And I encourage you to find people and choose to trust. It's not that it didn't take courage. It's not that I didn't have to take the risk. I did. But I chose to trust and was able to find freedom in that. You'd be surprised how people are more gracious than you'd ever think. So while these are some key points in how God has brought healing to some of my wounds, let me note a few things. What God uses to expose these wounds is unique. God will craft this unique situation to bring it out and to squeeze to the surface some of these issues. And you may already be aware of some of those places after I've talked this morning. But he does this. Secondly, healing takes time. It's rarely instant. Even a scar... Medical journals say it takes 12 to 18 months to fully heal. And I would parallel that to spiritual scars. It takes time to heal. Be patient with yourself and with God. And so, how do we recognize that a wound is a scar? Well, I'm going to tell you a couple things that I think will help you. First, and none of these are perfect diagnoses, so don't like say, if I meet the four criteria, it's a scar. I don't know if it is or not. Okay? But here are some things. First, when you can tell the story more as a piece of history or a testimony of God's healing rather than woe is me and from a place of pain. Secondly, when I can look the other person in the eye and smile at them truly, I know I've got a scar and not a wound. Thirdly, when I can pray for another person without resentment, I found that to be key. And fourthly, when you don't see yourself as a victim anymore, but have ownership over this. Three years ago, there was a Germanic conference at the UW with the German department, and it was celebrating one of the guys who had been there and was 80 years old, his 80th birthday, and some friends of the family were coming to town, and I asked to meet with them and have lunch and people I hadn't seen in many, many years. One of these was my mom's former partner, Evie 
who was now in her 70s. And I hadn't seen Evie in many years and actually avoided her because of the hurt in my heart. But after working through a lot of this, I was ready to see her. And so we planned lunch together, three of us. We had a nice lunch and I shared I was working at the church here and they were interested and were curious about what I believed in my faith, which really surprised me. It was great. At the end of the time, Evie said, can we take a walk? I said, sure. And so we walked around the Capitol. We were on State Street having lunch and we walked around the Capitol and toward the end of the walk, she said to me, Chris, are we good? And I said, Evie, what do you mean? She said, you know, I did some horrible things to you when, I, when you were little. And I don't know if you remember this or not, but there was this time where we fought over a steak bone. <laughs> and she said, I have not been able to eat a steak ever since then, and it has hurt me. I got to look at her and say, Evie, Yes, I do remember, and I forgive you. And go in peace, and go eat a steak. (laughs) And then I was able to grab her hand and say, we're good. I had no idea that that instance not only affected my life, but had affected hers and others. And these places of wounds, the healing and forgiveness, this was such a great God redemption moment. I hadn't planned it, they hadn't planned it. You know, it was just out of the blue. And when I told my mom, she was shocked. She said, Evie doesn't admit to her faults. I don't know if you know that, but she's never admitted to anything. So this was a real miracle. Let me take this to a place, my last point, which is helping others heal. And this is through wisely exposing our wounds and scars. Now, I want to caution you in this. Some of these wounds are great pearls. And scripture does say, don't throw your pearls before swine so that they may be trampled on. And so I say wisely expose because there are people who are hurt themselves who are not healed to a place that they can handle your scars or that they will respect them. And so I would be careful not to just cast them out there until you're ready. That said, exposing our wounds and scars to others is part of God's redemption in our own life and how God uses us to heal others. Here's a few ways. First, it helps others know it's safe to have wounds. (laughs) We're wounded. We're a wounded people. And we're wounded in battles. And we're wounded by all sorts of things that the enemy would love to sow these lies in. It helps others to know that there's hope for their own healing and actually increases faith. It helps others to see you as a resource that they can go to and say, you've dealt with this. Can you help me? And it helps them actually to make it all the way to the place of overcoming. Revelation 12, 11 says this about overcoming. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of the brethren has been thrown down. He who accuses them before our God day and night. Does that sound at all like those iPod tapes that are going on in your head? But listen to how they overcame. And they overcame because of the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. Because they did not love their life even when faced with death. It's the word of our testimony that comes from the scars that allows others to be free and to join more healed in the battle. Because we are in a battle. It's true. We're in a battle for the life that God has given us to freely give it. And you can't freely give when you're bound. You just can't. And God has great things, but we need to be free. Listen, there are people here today who have gone through all sorts of wounds. One of my buddies, Mike, who's, who's here, Mike, six years ago, decided that his life wasn't worth living, and he actually attempted suicide and jumped off a building. And Mike today is here saying, I may have been willing to throw away my life, but now I have laid down my life to give it to Christ And Mike is an incredible example of a man living for God and walking out of his scars rather than wounds. He's one of my heroes. 
Amen. <laughs> there are others who have been wounded in a whole variety of ways. Are there wounds that have been buried alive that need to be addressed in your life? Are there lies which you see in your own heart? Is God in a place of exposing wounds and you're working through them? Are you scarred but beautiful? What's your story? I'd like to pray for two groups of people today. First, maybe you're here and you don't have this God in your life that brings freedom. You don't even know who he is. But you've been hearing about him today and how he can actually help to take your brokenness and the lies and the wounds and begin a healing process. And I will tell you that God will do exactly that. And he doesn't require much. He actually just requires open arms. He has an invitation to you with open arms. It's a question, will you open your arms and your heart to him to receive him? So if you're here today, I'm gonna to tell you how to do that. It's as simple as saying, God, I've been wounded, I've been sinned against, and I've probably sinned against others. And God, I can't save myself, I can't bring myself out of this, but Lord, you can bring me out of this and you can bring freedom in my life. And I need you. And I wanna get off of running my own life, which seems to be failing, and instead, to sit at your feet and allow you to be Lord of my life. I'd like you to bow your heads, please, if you would. If that's you today, if you're a person who's here and saying, I need God, I don't have him in my life, I don't have a relationship with God, and you desire this, would you raise your hand just long enough for me to see it? No one's trying to embarrass you. Thank you, I see that hand. You may put that down. No one's trying to embarrass you. No one's trying to push you. This is a free will decision. But I will tell you that God is the beginning of healing. He's where it starts. Anyone else? Thank you, I see that hand. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. If you did raise your hands, I'd like you to keep your head, heads bowed and eyes closed. Just slip your hand over your heart and pray with me something like this. Lord Jesus, I thank you that you are a God who can see my scars and my wounds and my brokenness and you still love me. God, I ask you to come into my life, to be Lord of my life. Lord, I recognize that I need you to free me and to save me. And I embrace you, God and open my heart to you, in Jesus' name. If you prayed that prayer earnestly in your heart, God has brought you to a new, excuse me, God has brought you to a new place, and he will continue working from there. Secondly, if you're here, and this message has exposed wounds in your own life, or places that God is bringing to the surface, there are gonna be teams to pray afterward. I wanna pray with you first but there will be teams that will be here. And if this is a place that you feel safe and you want to expose something and need prayer, people will be here to minister as long as we can, as long as there's a need. Lord, we are a wounded people. God, we recognize that our wounds can cripple us from walking rightly with you. And God, I pray that those who have seen in their own life wounds, Lord, that you would begin to bring truth into these scars that have been left behind from circumstances and life situations and sins. God, I pray for a freedom. Lord, that you bring freedom. And Lord, that each person here who has a wound may expose it, may find that you are far more gracious and others are far more gracious than they ever thought to love them in their wounds. Thank you, God, that you don't reject us as wounded people but you embrace us. Lord, you say it's the proud that you resist, but you give grace to the humble. Lord, you say a bruised reed you will not cast out. And Lord, in that confidence, we can open our wounds to you and find freedom. And Lord, I pray that you'd work greatly in the lives of people here, Lord, that there will be more stories of how our scars 
are there because they have been healed from the wounds we used to carry. Thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to invite our prayer teams to come down and Nate, lead us in a little bit of worship if you wouldn't.